opening keynote is Professor Ni Quenor. He is, oh yeah, he deserves that applause. He's the founder of Ghana.com and he is the first Ghanaian PhD in computer science. And in 1979, he established the computer science department in um, University of Cape Coast, Ghana. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes on stage. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, initiate a discussion around the subject of technology and uh, development in particular, but also uh, the role that Bitcoin uh, does play in development, but from the point of view of uh, economic development and economic growth. Uh, in my normal day job, I'm a, a teacher of computer science at University of Cape Coast. Um, I teach courses like architecture and uh, algorithms and, and, and so forth. Um, but I'm trained as an operating systems person. And I've had a good life as a s systems programmer. But I also chair the Ghana.com um, board. Um, I want to share the orientation with which we've been doing our work here in Ghana. We are local engineers. And um, we know that technology can be used um, in a way to dominate an economy. Um, and we call that technocolonialism. And so in all our effort, we've been trying to make uh, it such that everybody around us is able to acquire some technical know-how and be able to contribute to the development. And bear in mind that supply chains can, can vary. Today is OK. We can import things into Ghana. In some other time, it may not be OK. So then what do you do? So you must make sure that you have the necessary or minimum. Yeah, please. Uh, you know, we'd like to make sure that um, we have sufficient minimum critical mass of expertise so that we are able to continue in which one? Which one? This one. This one. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So that's that's the spirit of it. So um, soon after my, you might say, a journey in the U.S. working for Digital Equipment Corporation, um, building CPUs, high-performance machines, and so on, I decided to come and join the effort to narrow the digital divide or prevent the digital divide at the time. And, and so our orientation is more about what is it that we have to do to ensure that we can continue with technical development of Africa. And of course, we've had many epochs in this case. We saw the epoch of creation of computer science departments. We saw the case of introduction of servers, you might call it today, meaning deck equipment and some microsystems deploying them, maintaining them, and so on and so forth, and making sure enterprise networks were working. And then we also saw the coming of the PCs. Uh, we also played a role there. And that led to the internet. And then, of course, we put the internet in place and made sure that we could spread it around so that everybody could be part. And fortunately, now we have the Bitcoin and we will do the same. And that is why we are part of this, this particular effort. So our orientation is about techno-liberation, avoiding techno-colonialism, and ensuring that everybody is empowered or has access to some level of technical support and is also able to advance it, irrespective of the global perspective of where we are locally in, in, on the continent. We naturally have played with proprietary standards. I mean, coming from DEC, you know, we used to run a DECnet here before we switched to uh, TCPIP. So we know that uh, the open standard is about the only opportunity the Global South has to participate as peers in this new era. But by that, what we mean is that there are three things. One is open participation. Okay? I should not need permission to come and participate. As long as I can appear and satisfy some basic uh, requirements, I should go to participate. So should my grandmother, if she so chooses. So the participation being open is extremely important. 
The second thing is the documents. Open documents are very, very important because we teach from them, we learn from them, you know, and we also correct ourselves, debug our things through them. And of course, you know, aside from that, the standards themselves, we are able to build things to those standards. So I follow the RFCs, that's the internet side. I follow your beeps, all right. Okay, we, we even read the ERCs and so on. So, so the whole idea is that the openness helps the global south to also participate. Now, the areas that I like to touch on uh, are in the technology areas of interest are uh, web merchant acquiring um, and also terminal equipment network uh, deployments. Uh, you know, Ghana.com is licensed um, operator according to the central bank, um, and yet all of our facilities we have are ready for Bitcoin and also the other cryptocurrencies. And so I'd like to share some of uh, the technologies that we are trying to develop in those areas. Now, in the equipment area, um, we, because of our strong feeling that we must be able to continue to advance a little bit, irrespective of what the global supply chain says, we also have our own fabrication lab uh, where we are able to produce our prototypes for the terminal equipment. And, at, and when we need to order in volume, then we have partners in the global space that we then reach out to to help us produce in volume. Now, what do we produce? We produce a family of products from um, small kiosks that take in cash and give you virtual products. So you, obviously, you can see it was a vehicle for <laughs> distribution of Bitcoin, you can see, because you put in cash and it's a virtual product. You can get mobile money, you, know, you can get airtime, and then you can get crypto if you so choose. So that's the nature of the things that we do. Of course, we've advanced and now we make ATMs and so on, but we use open standards. We, we run on Unix, okay? We run Linux, and that's the way we develop our things. But we're able to fabricate these things ourselves based on our own designs and using our own local engineers. Of course, we have lots of partners and lots of support, and we learn from lots of people, and, and, and that's how we continue. So you can see on the right, the, the, there's a, you know, a, a cutter there, and then there are other equipment. They have 3D printers, so they are able to, you know, make the thing, decorate the, the equipment for, for maybe human factors purposes and so forth. Now, in terms of the web acquiring, um, remember that we are coming from the internet, the web world, and so we are accredited registrars for putting names in .com, .org, .net, and so on. And so we have a lot of hosting facilities, and so we are able to you know, lay out different applications on top and want to provide service to those we host web, you know, whose websites we host. And part of the things they need to do is to also get into e-commerce by themselves. We want them to do it themselves. We don't want to do things. <laughs> We want people to do things themselves. So we provide interface that allows them to be able to uh, in very quickly develop their own e-commerce applications. So for example, they have, you can get a function. If you are receiving funds, you can receive mobile money. You can, of course, take payments in Visa, MasterCard. But so can you take payments in Bitcoin or Ethereum. And you can even take payments in our own native money, you might say based on the uh, facilities that we have. Likewise, depending on the credentials you have, you are able to also send Momo. So if you have money in your wallets on the uh, website, you are able to send Momo to somebody else. You are even able to pay money into the bank okay, of other clients and so on. And you can also, of course, uh, send Bitcoin and Ethereum and so on. So that's the nature of the structure that we have. Of course, that means that at the bottom of the infrastructure, we have lots of uh, nodes. You know, you have uh, Bitcoin nodes and you also have Ethereum nodes running within. So do we have gateways to various uh, telcos who are providing mobile money services and so forth? Now, naturally, since we are trying to mainstream, 
you know, these new technologies in the environment, we're going to have to learn how to meander in the regulatory regime. And uh, it's usually not straight straightforward because we expect that um, regulation will follow te technological advancements as opposed to ahead. Uh, but quite often, uh, regulators are also anxious as to the potential impact of the technology on people, and therefore, they also want to get in. But yet, at the same time, in the global south, we tend to want to wait and hear where the global dimensions or dynamics are before we decide. And all these things can affect the local development. So we, we strike, we try to stay at the boundary and continue to pressure and maintain dialogue with regulators at all times, but always educating and always demonstrating that we have capacity to do these things. Eventually, we'll get to a point just like the internet got, um, where everybody just accepts that we have no choice but to engage. And I think maybe in the case of Ghana, we may not be too far, but we are not there yet, because part of our license was uh, for us to remove cryptocurrencies from the objects of the company. So within the objects of the company, we don't have that, but we all know that we applied for it and we were put into the sandbox and we were tested thoroughly for our ability to do it properly. So we are confident that we are able to provide these services and at the right time, we'll turn the services on. Now, in this regulatory area, they normally don't tell us really what the problem is. They will tell you that it's anti-money laundering, KYC, and so forth. Um, and some may even complain that we consume too much energy and so on and so forth. But really, uh, I'm not convinced that is the real problem. The real problem is actually harder. And the real problem has to do with um, potential of breaking certain norms that you might say the financial regulatory environment is used to. In this case, I want to borrow the concept of Kinchugi that came up from a good friend of mine, Pinda Wong, also a Bitcoiner. I'm sure some of you know him. And here, the idea here is that while we are in the process of separating money from the state or moving from um, single currency, national currency to multi-currency environment, um, things may break. And when that happens, you should accept it because the internet breaks all the time, right? And we put it back together, we respond. It's about resilience. And so this example of Kinchugi says that in the Japanese you know, uh, historical uh, you know, uh, development, they had crafts that you can, when the pot breaks, a precious pot breaks, you are able to mend it back to be even stronger with gold. And that's what you see on the left. But what we mean here is that, you know, there are two, two main challenges appearing. One of them is fiscal, and then the other one is monetary. monetary. Now, in the fiscal realm, remember, if the sovereign is there, he is able to set tax rates for different things and therefore collect revenue. But as you move to a multi-currency environment, how are you going to even know where the, you know, the currency is? Where is the funds? So how are you going to be able to therefore generate revenue? And so if we really want to meander the regulatory environment properly, we're going to have to dialogue on how we're going to help nation states also continue to get revenue. Okay? And we cannot do that um, without you know, also compromising in some sense. So we have to figure out in the dialogue with the regulatory environment how we will be able to help them continue developing you know, public infrastructure for our purpose of development. So there's going to be you know, a fiscal sovereignty issue and then fiscal substitution issue. And to solve it properly may require some level of surveillance. And that is exactly what we also say we are not comfortable with. So it means that we have to sit down and have you know, heart-to-heart -heart discussion around this subject. The second one has to do with the monetary side of it. You know, uh, regulators will normally set interest rates and things of that sort, okay, so that they can also control the strength of their currency as they see it. 
Now, with the current environment we are moving into, not only are you faced with fiscal substitution, meaning you are losing control there, you are also losing currency, you know, there's currency substitution coming, so you are having to have to relax certain things that you are familiar with. Now, if we have such a situation, it means that we, the industry, who wants to mainstream the tools we have, we're going to have to, in some sense, help the environment uh, at least maintain some level of growth or development as we go forward. Okay, now let's come to ourselves. Now, in the case of the internet, you can see that in 1991, most of Africa did not have much of internet other than email. But within a period of about six, seven, eight years, uh, at least we had internet in capital cities and were then struggling on how to extend it to secondary cities. If you look at the case of, let's say, Bitcoin nodes, it shows what's on the left. Now, it, it, it may just be because we are from the south leveraging the infrastructure in the north. So that's the warning I'm giving that we must pay attention to developing the infrastructure in the south as well. I'm not saying don't host overseas. <laughs> I'm saying if you host some things overseas, you should host some things down here also. Otherwise, you are only contributing to the development of infrastructure in the West, widening the gap. And I'm here for Pan-African liberation. So I have to convince you that you should develop more infrastructure here so that everything doesn't move to the West and then I don't have to continue uh, struggling. Okay. So the question is, um, where do you think we'll be with Bitcoin in terms of the various infrastructure, starting from mining infrastructure to you know, whatever else we are gonna do, um, how would it shape up? I would prefer that we'll have lots of it on the continent, okay? And other continents are also developing so then we can be peers. And that is really where I, I, I'm trying to you know, negotiate that we, we move towards. I'd like to conclude with the following statement from uh, our first head of state in Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. And um, his point here is that none of us is going to be independent unless we are all independent. He was talking about political independence, but he knew that economic independence was there. And we are addressing the economic independence challenge. And so I'm asking, I don't think we are going to be free unless all of us are able to participate in this. And this should be the message that we take with us, that we all need ourselves to be active and, and very, you know, very strong in our belief in what we are doing. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.